Um, and so this is Pat Wright. I'm with Utah Geek Events. We run the Big Mountain Data Event and just about most of the other um, data events going on in the community around here. Um, I currently work at Entrada. I do uh, database engineering and lots of different things around that. Uh, ben and Chris will be doing our presentations today. They're both with Astronomer, correct? That's, I got that right, yep, with Astronomer. And they're gonna take over the presentation. And then if you have any questions, don't worry if you can't unmute, you can put it in the chat too. I'll watch the chat for you guys as well. So if we see it, but if you wanna unmute and give a question too, go right ahead. So thanks guys, take it away. Oop, let me get my chat out of here. Sorry. Bum, bum, bum. All right. Um, nice to meet everybody. Um, so my name is Ben Garrison. Um, I'm a new transplant to Salt Lake City um, and actually relatively new to the data space myself. Um, I uh, am a computer engineer by training um, and then went into a, the space of like mobile device management. Um, and so uh, then from there, I had mostly customer facing roles and then sort of recently switched into a pre-sales role as a field engineer at Astronomer. So um, here I've had the good fortune to be able to talk to many different people about how they're writing data pipelines, what they're using data for at their companies, and then um, being able to work at my company, Astronomer, who is the uh, commercial developer of open source Apache Airflow, which we'll kind of dive into a little bit what that is today. Um, but that's me. I'll turn it over. Chris, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh... Just want to echo what Ben said. We work with a lot of really talented individuals in the data space. Ben is an absolute rock star. He helps our customers on kind of the pre-sales process. I help them on the post-sales end, uh, so helping them with kind of implementation. So I see a lot of different use cases of our products across various data stacks, um, but uh, super awesome to work at Astronomer. Uh, I've been in Utah now for, oh, um, better part of my life. So uh, not, not really a transplant, but... Uh, but I've enjoyed a lot of skiing. Ben and I have gotten out and gone mountain biking. I'm, I'm, I'm giving away some of the local spots to him. I hope nobody hates me for that, but uh, it, is, it is what it is. Uh, good to be here with you tonight and excited to get started. Yeah, and, uh, and what we'll be covering today is um, Apache Airflow, the open source solution for kind of orchestrating data pipelines, um, as well as its interactions with DBT, how you can kind of set those up and then um, kind of a brand new uh, project that Chris kind of spearheaded with some other teammates at Astronomer called Project Cosmos um, and, and how that can uh, build on what uh, Airflow and DBT can do together. Um, but with that, let me, oops, sorry, here we go. Um, so just kind of some brief backstory on Apache Airflow, if you're not familiar. Um, it's an open source project founded in 2014. Um, I think the guy's name is Maxime um, at Airbnb who kind of uh, started it um, and then basically gave it to the Apache Foundation. Um, from there, it's been uh, used in, you know, by tons of different people. It's grown over the years. Um, Astronomer kind of uh, uh, jumped in and, and helped uh, build it up uh, starting in kind of 2018. And so we've seen uh, massive growth over the past few years. Um, so kind of those vanity metrics over there on the left are, you know, just that vanity metrics, but they do show there's kind of a robust community um, around Airflow, lots of people using it, lots of people run into problems and reach out to folks for clever solutions. And um, it's kind of grown uh, organically, um, as well as with um, with Astronomer backing it um, the past few years. But um, but the main functions of Apache Airflow um, are to provide you orchestration capabilities for your data pipelines. So you know, as a quick example, maybe I want to grab data that I've thrown in an S3 bucket, and then I want to run a transform on it, and then I want to pass that to Tableau in a new format and you know render it in my, my BI tool at the end of the pipeline. And so Apache Airflow sits in the middle of that and triggers jobs across that whole pipeline and gives you granular visibility into what happens along at each step. So if my transformation fails, I can go in and just retry that after I fix the problem. I don't have to restart a whole pipeline. Um, it gives you a lot of visibility as to where specific things fail so that um, you're able to uh, resolve issues faster and kind of build pipelines and, and generate value faster. But so that's kind of the orchestration bit. It can talk to all sorts of different um, tools that you may be using. So, you know, whether it's DBT or you're triggering Databricks jobs or jobs on Spark or um, BI tools of all, all sorts and varieties, or you're interacting with AWS, Google, Azure, you know, uh, infrastructure. Um, Airflow is kind of the 
the central nervous system that can communicate with and orchestrate all those pipelines. Um, the single kind of unit of like how we represent pipelines in Apache Airflow is with what's called a DAG. Um, that's short for directed acyclic, acyclic graph, but effectively it just means you know, my tasks are all kind of moving in one direction. There's no cycles that can be created. Once I get to the end of my pipeline, it doesn't automatically go back and trigger, you know, a previous task in that same pipeline. So that kind of helps with um, being able to rerun pipelines on the same set of data and always get the same output. So there's kind of some basic tenets of uh, idempotency um, in, in Airflow built in. But but yeah, basically all you need to know is the unit, like when you are defining a pipeline, like, you know, grab this data from S3, transform it, throw it in Tableau, that's a pipeline that would be one DAG in your Airflow um, instance. Um, and what that kind of looks like um, is, I just captured a screenshot here, but, um, and we'll dive into the different components of Airflow in a second, but um, what you're seeing here, every line item is a separate DAG, a separate pipeline that's doing something for you. Um, you can turn on and off different DAGs. You can click into a DAG and go see the individual tasks, the individual steps of your pipeline, and kind of uh, even click into them and see task logs and what went wrong, what went right. Um, and and uh, the buttons kind of over to the right allow you to trigger pipelines. Maybe you're doing some troubleshooting or you noticed an error and you went and fixed it and now you want to rerun that pipeline. You can come in here and kind of manage all that from the Airflow user interface. Um, but so this is just to give you an idea of what Airflow provides you um, when you are managing and, and building pipelines. Um, so kind of diving into what's under the hood with Airflow, there's a handful of different components. Um, what we just looked at is that web server. So um, that's what you primarily interact with, uh, but, but it is a Python-based tool. Um, so you're actually writing your pipelines as code, um, generally Python code. Um, but you can also write in SQL and kind of wrap that um, into your DAGs. Um, and basically, these are all just files that you are creating. And you can store in a repository, manage with CI processes, et cetera. Um, so it can really fit into your code development um, story at, at your company. Um, but, but at the end of the day, each of those files represents a different DAG, a different pipeline. And those get represented in that web server that you can interact with. Um, underneath that, there's a component called the scheduler. The scheduler is a super important piece of Airflow in that it basically on a regular interval will parse through all of your DAGs, all of your DAG files, um, and will basically say, okay, what's changed in them? Do I need to update the UI with you know, this new task that you added to a pipeline? Um, and also it will say, hey, I see that you've scheduled this DAG for you know, uh, Tuesday of next week, or you're scheduling it for, you know, every day at midnight, um, it will go in and it will create logical jobs in the underlying database. Um, and then those jobs uh, will actually get kicked off at those appropriate times. So that's the other major function of Airflow is to actual, actually schedule um, your repeated pipeline processes. Um, so um, so that way, you know, if you have reports that want to come out every day at 4 p.m. Or, or financial analyses, you know, that have some SLA tied to them, um, you can actually set schedules for your pipelines um, and have them run um, automatically there. But, um, but yeah, so that's what the scheduler does. It, it reads your pipelines and then schedules the individual tasks that are the different steps of your pipeline. Um, the database is, is kind of self-explanatory there. This is where all the metadata around Airflow is stored. So each time the scheduler is creating a new task for some DAG, right? You've got a DAG, you're gonna run it once a day at midnight. So you've got you know seven DAG runs per week. Um, it'll have each of those kind of logically separated along with the individual tasks um, that are part of each of those DAG runs. So all that's stored in the database along with any environment variables or customizations or or other stuff that um, you know you're uh, maybe you're changing the branding of your Airflow or you've got custom plugins that add in a, a reporting feature, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it's a very customizable solution. Um, but anyways, that's what the database is for. Um, um, the executor. So we also have kind of a debate whether it's called executor or executor. So that, it's still open for um, open for ideas there. But the executor is a function that says okay, the scheduler has sent me these tasks that need to be executed. Now I need to decide how to execute them. Um, so 
Underneath the hood, um, there's different methods of doing this. You can use celery, um, but basically you need some queuing model to say, hey, what's the priority of when these tasks should execute and where should they execute? And this kind of dives into kind of a broader topic, which I won't get into too deeply, but the infrastructure on which Airflow runs is important. If you're running it just on a single server or maybe an EC2 instance, or um, if you're trying to scale Airflow and you need lots of worker nodes to actually do all the jobs that you're scheduling, you may consider running Airflow on a Kubernetes um, infrastructure. And that has you know, a whole nother layer of, of kind of config and, and management attached to that. But, but effectively, the executor is the one that's saying, hey, I'm going to go grab those scheduled jobs and I'm going to decide where to send them, how to execute them, and when. Um, so that's what that piece is for. Um, and then I mentioned this already, but workers, these are the, the things that actually do the work, right? So if you have a task that you know needs X amount of resources, the worker is the node, especially in Kubernetes, that will get spun up to handle that job and um, run the actual work being done. So um, there's kind of two lines of thought of how most folks use Airflow. Um, one is to use it primarily as an orchestrator, just, you know, the brain that's reaching out to Databricks or reaching out to, to Spark or, you know, triggering a job and tracking whether that job is getting done, um, but not actually doing any computation in Airflow memory itself. Um, so that's kind of like option one. Um, and up until recently, that was kind of the recommended path um, for how to leverage Airflow. Um, the second option is to actually do computation in Airflow itself. Um, if you're running Airflow yourself and not on a Kubernetes cluster, then this presents some challenges because now you have to manage resources and the underlying infrastructure as you grow and scale. You know, maybe you add a, a pipeline and it fails because there's not enough memory to execute all the jobs you had in there. So that comes with an element of infrastructure maintenance. Um, if you're running on a Kubernetes cluster, you can kind of set up some auto scaling functions. So that as you add more pipelines, as you require more resources, you can actually auto scale up and down to kind of meet your demand there. Um, but that's in effect what the workers are. They're the ones actually doing the computation of, you know, maybe whatever transformation you're writing. Um, and lastly, the trigger, this is actually a pretty new feature in Airflow. Um, the idea here was actually that there was a problem with the architecture of Airflow in that Let's say, hey, I'm triggering a Databricks job, or I'm, you know, I'm orchestrating and, and telling Databricks to go run some job, and that job takes four hours. The resources that were used in Airflow to manage that would be basically locked up for those four hours until that Databricks job finished and told Airflow, hey, I'm good to go. Um, and so in order to kind of recycle those, we've introduced this concept of a trigger, which will allow you to uh, basically defer those tasks that are getting executed external to Airflow. Um, and so then when we get a note back from that external solution, um, we'll actually spin back up the, the resources needed to go on to the next step in Airflow. So this is mostly meant to kind of save you on resource costs when you're running Airflow, um, especially in the case of I'm triggering jobs in external solutions generally. So um, a more specific component, but I just wanted to um, describe what that's for. I'll, I'll actually pause there for a second. Are there any questions on any of these or, or do these all make sense? Chris has been taking some of them in the chat, it looks like already, so. Oh, okay, great, awesome. Side Thanks. questions. <laughs> all right, well, I will move on. Um, but yeah, so those are kind of the, the basic components that make up Airflow. And so that UI that I that you saw was basically all served by those different components kind of managing parts and pieces of Airflow. Um, one of the core concepts of when you're actually writing your Airflow pipelines, your DAGs, um, is how, how do you make Airflow talk to those other data sources, right? Like how do I trigger a Databricks job? How do I reach out to an S3 bucket and, and see what files are there? Um, so what we, what, Airflow has been architected to, to operate is basically to have these provider packages um, that basically define how you can interact with those external tools. So in a provider package, you'll have all your different, they're called hooks, modules, hooks, and operators, um, which I'll get to in a second. But basically things like, how do I actually talk to Airbyte? How do I actually talk to an S3 bucket and list contents or, or upload a file to S3 bucket? But 
um, these provider packages you will install in your um, Airflow environment. And then when you're writing your pipelines, you can reference the different um, code modules um, and basically leverage them. Um, so the nice part about that is you're not rewriting you know, these connections to all these different data sources. This has been provided by the community of Airflow. Um, and so it's kind of continually growing, especially as you know, some tools gain popularity and others kind of lose uh, lose popularity. That it kind of shifts a little bit, but um, uh, but that's what the provider packages are, um, allowing you to reuse code given by the community, built by the community. And actually, on that note, because Airflow is open source, we do urge and and recommend people. Hey, if if you're connecting to a tool that doesn't have an existing provider package and and you want to write one. And contribute it back to Airflow. You know, we love that. We we um, and, and we can provide help and guidance on how to do that as well. But um, but yeah, so that's what provider packages are. What you're looking at a screenshot here is actually a, a website that Astronomer built to basically make it much easier to search for information about those provider packages. So if I want to find a sample DAG someone's written about how to you know uh, upload or run some SQL against my Snowflake instance, I can go here and search for it and then find that very easily. So kind of helping uh, developers who are working in Airflow. Um, I mentioned this uh, another second ago, but the actual operators are what are the code functions within those provider packages that you'd be leveraging. So um, apologies for some of the dark text here, um, but um, but basically, there's some operators that are built into base Airflow itself and are available out of the box when you install Airflow. And others, you have to install that provider package um, in your Airflow environment. So if you're going to be interacting with Databricks and you want to run a, a particular job on Databricks, maybe you'll use the Databricks submit run operator. Um, and then we've got documentation, uh, or Airflow's got documentation on what parameters you specify to be able to talk to your Databricks instance and actually trigger some job ID um, as an example. But, but basically, operators are the single unit of work that you specify in your DAG code um, that will go execute some function, right? Like, I want to do a transfer of data directly from S3 to Snowflake. Um, this operator is what I would use there to kind of manage that, um, manage that connection. But, um, but yeah, so that's operators. Um, kind of taking a step back here. So, um, you know, I talked about Airflow being open source and, and kind of going through a lot of revisions, um, especially in the past year with Astronomer behind it. We've kind of pushed forward with lots of new releases and lots of new features. Um, but I'm not going to go through all of those because obviously that would take a while. But um, suffice it to say, because of the growth of Airflow um, and the community behind it and the, the needs of, you know, I'm writing my pipelines or maybe I'm starting to get into machine learning models and I want to be able to manage portions of that um, pipeline in Airflow. Um, lots of new features are being built to kind of um, aid all those use cases. Um, so kind of a, a regular interval of releases here. But um, but yeah, so what we came to talk about today, that was kind of the, the backstory on what Airflow is and how folks use it, what it provides you. Um, but uh, one of the most popular tools that we see a lot of clients uh, working with is DBT. So, you know, being able to transform uh, different uh, data uh, for various reasons, various pipelines, um, and how can I orchestrate that with Airflow, right? DBT does the actual processing, transforming for me. Airflow I use to orchestrate that and say when to do it. Um, but there's a lot of different ways to actually enact this integration between Airflow and DBT, and I'll actually turn it over to Chris at this point to kind of guide you through some of those. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. So uh, if, for those who are unfamiliar with DBT, uh, it's, it's really like a CLI tool or command line interface tool uh, that analysts have just fallen in love with. Uh, they have both a cloud offering as well as kind of a, an open source offering uh, called DBT Core. Uh, so the product that Cosmos does is it, it uses DBT Core, but we're going to talk kind of about how um, DBT kind of took the world by storm in terms of like the data analytics space why people love it, uh, and how it was integrated into Airflow previously, and uh, how to how we made that experience a little bit better. Uh, so traditionally, with uh, DBT Core, what it, what it does is you write SQL, and you can they have different adapters. So you can write SQL for a Postgres database, for a for a 
a BigQuery database, a Snowflake database, a Redshift database. They have all these adapters so that you can kind of keep your SQL, um, the basic building blocks of SQL as SQL and not have to worry too much about how that SQL is uh, compiled by your target database. Uh, and then they use Jinja templating uh, on top of that SQL to dynamically define uh, dependencies between your SQL files. So meaning if you have a Jinja template variable in one SQL file that's referencing another SQL file, when you run your dbt model, it will know to run SQL A and then SQL B, and it will define those dependencies for you. So there's like a lot of really neat tricks out of the box that dbt provides. Additionally, it has a lot of uh, built-in tests for data quality checks um, and ways to document uh, your data in your data warehouse or your database uh, and basically uh, builds data dictionaries for you out of the box. And so as you can imagine, a lot of you know, analytics engineers and data analysts and data engineers in this space uh, you know, get really excited when they see dbt because it saves them a lot of work and a lot of heartache and a lot of headache. Uh, so a common question that we get is, you know, we have Airflow. How do we how do we orchestrate it? How do we orchestrate DBT? How do we run DBT with Airflow? How do they how do they play together? And uh, you know, the the story leading into that was was not a first class story. It was it was pretty sad, honestly, uh, because customers were forced through um, if they didn't pay for a subscription on DBT Cloud, which is a first class story. Uh, but if they were using the open source dbt core library, um, they were forced to use what's called a bash operator in Airflow to run like a CLI command. And it felt very, um, for lack of a better word, hacky um, to, to do that within like an Airflow orchestration. And additionally, Airflow, you had, to, you had to do significant lift and work to get dbt jobs to parse out in Airflow. So if you wanted to run like individual steps, a lot like you can in dbt, um, let's say you want to run a SQL file or, um, you know, a set of SQL files instead of like an entire dbt project. Um, getting that to parse out in Airflow took significant effort. So um, that's that was kind of the story or the usual way is that, um, you know, those dependencies that are that are dynamically defined within your SQL and all of the, the data quality checks and all that stuff, it there was kind of a roundabout way to do it with the bash operator and running basically a CLI bash command uh, using a bash operator in Airflow, but it wasn't really a first class story. Uh, ben, you can go to the next slide. So uh, then the, the customers that had dbt cloud and they were paying for you know subscriptions on dbt cloud, they, they had a little bit better of an experience. We had Ben, you can, I think if you click, it'll show like a code box below this visual, if I'm not mistaken. You, they had, uh, as you can see, they have like a dbt cloud run job operator on that fourth line. So they had a custom operator to interact with dbt cloud uh, and they could run their dbt jobs in, that were that were hosted in the cloud. And, and that, was, that was great, except um, they still had to execute the Airflow DAG and they were switching back and forth between the dbt cloud interface and their airflow interface to like debug what was going wrong in dbt or what was going wrong in airflow and it just still left something to be desired in that way um, but at least it wasn't as hacky as the previous solution um, ben you can go to the next slide so uh you know a little bit more continued uh a little bit more on that is we released a blog a series of blog posts at astronomer showing how to um, achieve the functionality of dynamically parsing out um, your your dependencies between your dbt SQL files and models uh, inside of Airflow with the with the free dbt offering, the dbt core offering. Um, but as you can see, with kind of those pros and cons, it, it still was a lot of manual process. Uh, it wasn't generated at runtime. It made CI/CD processes much more complicated because it created this chicken or egg scenario of like parsing out a file to recognize those dependencies versus that file not being there and Airflow looking for it. So it just still felt a little bit hacky and just not quite fully fleshed out yet. But we, those series of blogs that we published over the last two years, it allowed our customers to get to a point where it was like, okay, we can use the dbt core, you know, open source free offering within Airflow. And that was kind of the best story until our Hack Week team uh, put together Cosmos and Cos Cosmos has received a lot of demand. And that, we'll talk a little bit more on that about the next slide. So 
when you use Cosmos, and uh, when I say Cosmos, you may have heard Ben kind of allude to that when he introduced this slide deck, but Cosmos is a project uh, that was developed internally at Astronomer. It is also open source, meaning uh, accepting contributions from the open source community uh, and available to use by the open source community. Uh, I don't believe you have to be an Astronomer customer to use Cosmos. If you're running open source Airflow you know, and hosting it yourself, uh, you, it's pip installable right into your Airflow uh, Airflow environment, and really what it allows you to do is it integrates the parts of DBT that were frustrating with Airflow a lot better. So uh, you can manage your database connections within Airflow or a sec uh, supported secrets backend. So if you have connections to your Snowflake database or Redshift or BigQuery, whatever you're using, you can set those connections in Airflow, and then you can pass them to a suite of uh, DBT core airflow operators. So that was the next thing is our developers and our users no longer have to rely on that bash operator that again, I said felt a little bit hacky because it was like running a CLI command to, to run DBT workloads or for DBT core. Uh, so now there's a suite of operators that are included with that, uh, with Cosmos. And then lastly, something else that we found constantly coming up with our customers is dbt and airflow they share a lot of um, common core dependencies jinja being one of those so if a new shiny update came out for airflow or for dbt uh what our customers would rush to to upgrade and they'd be super excited to get all these new features but just to find that their images were no longer building and that they were in dependency hell um, so with that the native support for Venn kind of sol solves that allowing you to put dbt inside a virtual environment within airflow and separate those dependencies so that you can have the best and latest features of, of both Airflow and dbt. Um, as and, you can see in this, one, oh, sorry, one, go ahead. Yeah, one quick note in here, this image we're looking at, this is actually what you would see in Airflow if you clicked into one of those DAGs that I showed you in uh, the previous slide. So this is an example DAG that has bubble air bubbles, basically, that represent your different steps, different um, tasks within a single data pipeline, uh, just to explain that image. Perfect. Thanks, Ben. And with what we're seeing here, this is this is a this is a classical like hello world example of uh, called Jappel shop. And this is an example that DBT core has made publicly available. And it's parsing an airflow using Cosmos. So we we write a, a, a class or we import a class from Cosmos Cosmos after it's pip installed into your airflow environment. We point it towards the uh, towards the DBT project directory for a Jaffle shop and it parses out all of these nodes. Um, and as you can see, stage the there's like the light blue box, the big one, and then there's a, another light blue box uh, with two red boxes within it in that, and it's labeled SCG customers. And there's those two nodes, those orange nodes, the run and the test, right? That would be the ind individual task running within this DAG. So there's a run step where it's actually compiling and running the SQL that you've written for DBT. And then there's a test step, which is running a suite of uh, uh, data quality checks against that SQL to check for things like duplicates, nulls, uh, you know, uh, unique values, all that good stuff. Um, and so this is really a traditional use case of DBT, of, of running that run on your model and then running a test just to make sure the data quality is, is ship shape. I think we've all been in that situation where data quality isn't and it's a really frustrating experience. So cool. Um, that being said, uh, and I see if, I see one question in the chat. We will absolutely, I think we can absolutely send this presentation out after this meeting. So we, we will do that. Um, I do, I am prepared to share like a demo of a uh, live working uh, sandbox of Cosmos with those examples. Uh, so I was just going to jump into that. But before I do so, I uh, would love to just pause for a few seconds. And if anybody has any questions, uh, we can answer those. Also to that comment, we will record, this is being recorded and we're sending it up to YouTube as well. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, cool. Uh, so that being said, I'll I'll start sharing, and I'm just going to bring up a sandbox of uh, of Cosmos, and we'll we'll take a look there. And if anybody um, has questions, feel free to direct those towards the chat. Then we'll then we'll take over answering questions in the chat, and I'll just kind of keep presenting here. Cool. Okay. So, um, by the way, 
uh, I think it was uh, Norm had a question of like, hey, what what capabilities do we have with Hex Notebooks? So if you haven't been to um, registry.astronomer.io before, I'd highly recommend it. This is kind of like an index or a library of those integrations. I think Ben kind of showed this a little bit on his demonstration, but I was like, huh, I wonder if they do have an S3 to Hex or a Hex to S3 operator, which is what Norm was asking originally. So I came in here and I just started searching like S3 to, and it gives you a bunch of operators. Like you can see like, hey, there's S3 to FTP, there's S3 to Snowflake, right? So there's a lot of things in searchability and and uh, like a library of components that you can you can take a look at. And anything that's in here isn't necessarily specific to astronomer customers. Like if you're running and managing Airflow on your own, these are all open source uh, classes that you can pip install into your Airflow environment and call within your DAGs. Uh, so yeah, just wanted to throw that out there. So let's uh, let's dive into Cosmos. So Cosmos, we've shipped this to PyPy. So again, this is publicly available. Uh, pip installable. It is in a pre-release state. We haven't got to stable release, although we do have customers here at Astronomer that are running it in production and giving us active feedback. Uh, so those are our guinea pigs. They they know what they've gotten themselves into, and they're pretty happy with it. Uh, so so far, so that's good. Uh, so yeah, it's pip installable, uh, available on PyPy. Here is the um, project repo. I'll drop a link in the chat here right now. And a common question we get is like, okay, you made this experience easier, but how much easier is it? And usually to answer that question, what I do is I say, let's just bring up a sandbox and take a look. So I'm just going to clone a fresh um, copy of this repo to my desktop. So I don't have it right here. So we'll just say git clone. And that will clone Astronomer Cosmos down. Uh, and again, this is a public facing repo. So any of you can do this. Um, so if we jump into Astronomer Cosmos now, we can see that we have the repo that we cloned from online and we have an examples directory within there. And that examples directory actually has a sandbox environment pre-configured and so that we can bring that up. So if we go to that examples directory, I'm using, I'm going to use the Astro CLI that we've developed here at Astronomer. And that will allow me if I have Docker installed on my computer, Docker desktop, it'll allow me to bring up some containers and a sandbox of Airflow. Uh, and just, it just so happens that we've configured this examples directory to have Cosmos pre-installed uh, with working DAGs to see how it works and to play around with it. Uh, for those of you who are interested in installing the Astro CLI or playing around with it, it is a free tool from Astronomer. Uh, you don't have to be an Astronomer customer to use the Astro CLI. Here is the quick start guide. I'm gonna drop that in the chat as well. So if you want to get hands on, there's uh, installation instructions for Mac, Windows, Linux, all the all the big operating systems on that documentation that I just sent. Um, but from here, one, now that I have that Astro CLI installed, or once you install it, you'll be able to run Astro commands. And so um, here is my you know Astro CLI, and I'm just going to run an Astro Dev start command. And what this does is it initializes the sandbox using Docker Desktop, and it will bring up some Docker containers. Uh, that hold those various components that Ben discussed, talked about. So it has like the web server in it, it has a meta database uh, based on Postgres, it has a scheduler, it has a trigger. Uh, I think those are the only four that we need to run stuff locally. It's just using a local executor. So it's not like anything you're gonna be able to run, you know, a thousand tasks on. It's really just a way to test uh, things locally. And so as that's coming up, let's uh, open our IDE and take a look at what's in this e examples directory. And I'll just use VS Code here. And we'll just open that Astronomer Cosmos examples directory and take a look under the hood while our containers are building. So in here, you'll see kind of, if you're familiar with Airflow, if you've, if you've ever used Airflow, there's kind of a, uh, a set of traditional files or folders that you will see inside of your environment. Uh, most commonly are the DAGs, right? So you'll see in the DAGs directory, you'll see a bunch of Python files that house the code for your, for, that instantiate your DAGs uh, within the Airflow environment that's building. Uh, I've included this directory. This is a dbt directory containing those dbt projects. Uh, so this is specific to the Cosmos repo. You won't no normally see this, uh, but this is how we've advised our customers to set up DB like multiple dbt projects embedded within Airflow. 
And then uh, there's a test directory where you can write unit tests for your uh, airflow deployment. Uh, that's kind of astronomer specific. I don't think I, it might exist in the OSS world now. I have, it's been a minute since I've spun up an OSS instance of uh, airflow. And then just kind of the usuals. You also see a Docker file, the requirements.txt for your pip installations. And you'll notice here we have Astronomer Cosmos. And so that's install, pip installing it into the containers as those containers are coming up in the background in my CLI. Uh, and so you see a lot of that. Now, let's take a peek just real quickly at that DBT Jaffle shop example. You'll see these are really common directories that you see in a DBT project, right? So we've gone over the common directories and files that you see in Airflow, but these are the common ones that you see in DBT now. So models is usually where you store all of your SQL. And what you'll see, I mentioned Jinja template variables, right? So you see that that's these double curly brace items right here. And it's selecting from this STG customers. Well, STG customers is just another SQL file. So this is what I was talking about a little bit earlier, where if you have Jinja template variables in your SQL that are referencing other files within this models directory of SQLs files, uh, it will dynamically say, hey, um, the customers.sql references this STG customer SQL. Run the STG customer SQL first and then run the customer SQL. So it dynamically creates this dependency chain for you when you run your dbt run commands. Uh, and that's something that developers absolutely love is like, I don't have to think about where I place my Python and, and order of execution of my SQL. It just does it for me, right? And that's something that everybody loves about dbt. So uh, these, there's other SQL files, and this is what you'll see ultimately be parsed out inside of the Airflow environment. You saw on the last slide of our presentation with the Jaffle shop example. Um, and we'll talk about why you want, might want to do that inside of Airflow after we get our sandbox up and running here. Um, so as you can see, our containers are starting up, uh, just kind of in the final stages here of getting our sandbox running. <clears throat> and as we do that, the last thing I do want to show inside of our, um, our uh, IDE and these project files is we have a Docker file. This is holding the astronomer runtime image for airflow we provide this image this is i mean you could publicly this is a publicly available image uh and this is what kind of the astro cli uses to build that sandbox and also also it's like the production image for our customers as well uh and then as you can see in here i've actually created a virtual environment as a step in this docker file so this run command is saying hey create a virtual environment uh it looks like our sandbox is up. We'll come back to that in just a second. Hey, create a virtual environment. And then I want you to pip install everything in this dbt requirements.txt into that virtual environment. And as you can see in the dbt requirements.txt, I have dbt core and dbt postgres, which are their free offerings, right? Uh, and then that allows me to have that separated dependencies from Airflow from dbt so that we don't end up in dependency hell. I kind of talked a little bit about that earlier. And then lastly, we have a Docker compose override file that mounts this dbt directory right here into the container so any changes that we make in our in our ide and visual studio code on our on our laptop will be synced with the docker containers so it'll pick up changes real time so we don't have to restart our containers every single time we make a change to sql and want to test it so uh, just a couple of uh, points there as to what exists within this project now, if we go to after our CLI finishes building, you'll see a message like this. It'll say, hey, you can go look at the Airflow web server at localhost 8080. You have a Postgres database at this port, uh, and here's the default credentials to access both of those. If we actually run a Docker PS command, you can see all of the containers that are up. There's the web server. There's four of them. There's the web server. There's the scheduler, the trigger, the Airflow metadatabase, those kind of key components that Ben talked about in his presentation. So let's jump over to the web server and um, type in those default credentials, which is just admin admin. And the cool thing about the sandbox as well is if you go to admin connections, uh, this Airflow DB connection was created as part of the process of building those containers. And this is connecting to that Postgres data meta database that's in our Docker container. So we have a kind of like a sandbox, if you will, to test out our DBT models and build them and run that SQL. Uh, I wouldn't recommend this for like a, a production level environment for, but just for a little proof of concept, it works pretty nicely. Uh, so we're just going to use that Docker uh, Postgres database. 
and to run our DAGs. Now, um, this brings us to kind of the kind of the 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 crux or the the climax, if you will, of of the of the story. In that, what do you get when you run DBT in Airflow versus just having DBT or just Airflow? Right. Well, um, DBT really prides itself on being the T acronym of ETL. Uh, I mean, they do a lot. They do more than that as well, but that's probably the piece that they do the best is the transform, right? And if you go to any of their type high, uh, like DBT core installation pa docs pages, that's actually the first paragraph saying that they are the T of ETL. But that leaves a lot to be desired, right? You still have the E and L step of your ETL. And so Airflow can fill those gaps quite nicely uh, where you have the, that extract need. Maybe you're reading from an HTTP endpoint or you are reading from an SFTP or a, maybe another database or you know fill in the blank. Whatever that E may be, Airflow can help orchestrate that E. Uh, DBT can do the T where it, it runs a lot of transformative SQL to build star schemas or whatever else inside of your data warehouse. And then Air uh, Airflow can pick up the L piece uh, on the load and either do a reverse ETL into a system like Salesforce or Zendesk, or it can put it into back into a data warehouse or it can you know fill in the blank. So uh, it kind of completes that full acronym when you're kind of using them together. Now you could use Airflow to do a lot of the things that DBT does. In fact, I'm fully confident we could accomplish the same results in Airflow that you can in DBT, but DBT just makes it much faster. You can do a lot more in DBT on the T-step much more quickly using DBT than you would doing it in Airflow with a lot less manual work and a lot less code to maintain. So that's kind of the motivation here. Now to, to, to bring that to, to light, right? Look, I'm just gonna go into this DAG dependencies um, view. And you'll see I have an extract DAG, which is our E, right? This, again, I gave examples of ingesting from an HTTP endpoint. Maybe it's getting files out of an SFTP server, or maybe an S3 bucket, right? So that's your extract. And then here's Chaffle Shop, MRR Playbook, Attribution Playbook, which are our DBT projects. So those are doing transformative SQL and data quality checks on that data. Uh, so that's the T of our ETL. And then lastly, we have some load DAGs. You can, these are just dummy DAGs for visualization, but you could imagine that these are doing reverse ETLs into, again, Salesforce or Snowflake, or you're doing reporting off of that transform SQL after you've done all of your data quality checks and all that good stuff. So this is kind of the big picture, right? Is it's like, I can create cross DAG dependencies and create this beautiful kind of ETL pipeline that utilizes the best parts of Airflow and the best parts of DBT to, to get an end-to-end -end pipeline. And that's what we're looking at here. Um, so all of the green nodes, right, that you see here are our DAGs um, that we, if we go back to our IDE, there's all the DAG files housing each of these DAGs and definitions for how these DAGs should run, uh, the dependencies between each of them. And, and whatnot. And if we go back to the DAGs list, right, you see those same DAGs uh, that were those green nodes on the previous page. And then you have the ability uh, to set up dependencies between DAGs. So we have some orange uh, nodes here. Those are our data sets. And there's a uh, syntax inside of those DAGs that say, hey, when the Jaffle Shop data set gets updated from the extract DAG, go ahead and trigger the Jaffle Shop DAG, right? So essentially we're setting cross DAG dependencies between all of these nodes. So that's kind of the full picture, but let's actually just run it and see what this looks like. So I've um, I've set this up so that we can just sort by owner, and it will give us kind of an ordinal an ordinal run of what's supposed to run in, in sequence. And you'll notice our extract DAG has a schedule on it to run daily, meaning at midnight UTC every single day. If this DAG was unpaused, if we un if we check this, it would trigger, it would schedule, and it would run a series of tasks within that DAG. And then as you can see, each of the schedules on these other ones are data set, meaning there's a data set upstream that needs to get updated. And then Java Shop will run, Attribution Playbook will run, MRR Playbook will run, Load DAG A will run, Load DAG B will run. So in theory, um, if I uncheck all of these, it should start with Extract DAG and it should move down and run all of the ETL pipeline. So I'm just going to go ahead and unpause all of those. And that'll start running them. So um, as, we're, as we're waiting for that pipeline to run, let's take a look at what's actually in the extract DAG. 
Um, so we have just a few imports up here. We have a DAG definition. Um, and you can see we're importing from Cosmos. So we have those operators. So we have a DPT run operator, a DPT seed operator. So again, we don't have to use bash operators to essentially run a CLI command. We have a specific operator now that, um, that we can run to do a DBT command. And as you can see, we're, we're creating a set of DBT run operators and we're passing that Airflow DB, DB connection to it uh, to connect to the Postgres database that's running in Docker. So it's basically running this operator or the set of DBT CLI commands against the Docker database uh, that's running that's running uh, the Docker Postgres database. Uh, we have a Python virtual environment path, which is basically the path to the virtual environment that we set up in our Docker file that again, keeps this dependencies between Airflow and DBT separate so that there's not dependency clashes and whatnot. So um, these are kind of like, this is what makes up tasks, right? And I'm using a for loop, so I'm generating tasks dynamically. Um, but what we see, kind of the basic building blocks is you see a DAG class here, and this is where you define things like, hey, this DAG starting on November 27th, this DAG should run daily. Uh, and you could set a cron schedule here. So it's like, hey, I want this to run every five minutes or I want this to run every month or weekly or whatever that might be, right? Or you can set none here and trigger the DAG via a REST API call. Um, so possibilities are pretty endless in terms of what you wanna do there. Um, I have a doc MD, little nice description of the dot of the DAG, and that's a visible in the UI as well. And just a couple other per parameters that are pertinent to this DAG. Um, and then the tasks that are defined here, uh, we're using task groups. So that's grouping those tasks into nice uh, clusters that we can see in the UI. So going into the extract DAG, um, if we go to the graph view, <clears throat> Here are the seeds that are in that task group. So this is considered a task group, the ability to expand and unexpand a, uh, a group of nodes. And then you can set dependencies between task groups. So it's running all of these items. Um, and then after all these run, then it runs all of these items. So it's dropping the seeds if they exist, and then it's recreating those seeds. Uh, so going back in here, you can see there's like a, a bit shift operator between those two DAS groups setting that dependency. So uh, that's kind of like the basic building blocks of a DAG and the Python syntax that makes up a DAG is the DAG class. You have typically an operator um, or a set of operators, as well as a, bit, a chain of bit shifts to define dependencies between those operators. And a and so, quick note quick note on the dependencies. This is one of the, the major benefits of using Airflow as a solution is that you can use that to have full control over what order tasks take in your pipeline. So if you want to run a, a Databricks job, but you don't want to run it until some upstream data set completes, that's where you would come in and set dependencies between those so that you can kind of control when things happen um, and, and be um, optimizing those. But um, yeah, quick note. Yeah, and a common question, like one of the one of the biggest pain points I think a lot of data engineers have that come come to us, right, um, is knowing when a pipeline breaks and where it breaks. Because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. I think we all know if you've engineered any data pipeline that data changes, uh, dirty data gets pushed in or whatnot, and a data pipeline will break. So Airflow also gives you the ability to have things like failure callbacks. So you can set those at a DAG level and you can have that um, send you a Slack message or a Teams message, or basically it does any Python function. So, I mean, you, if you use Twilio, it can send you a text, right? If you're using their API or whatever it is, you can set failure callbacks so that you can be notified if a step in your, if you're in your DAG fails. Um, so there's, there's some, there's a lot of really nice advantages to, to Airflow and, and setting those dependency chains and knowing at a very granular level, what may have failed or succeeded and when it failed and how to mitigate for it and make your, make sure your data is, is fixed. Um, so cool. This is only showing like a couple of operators from DBT. Um, so let's go into like an actual DBT DAG. Like I think I gave that example of Jaffle shop. So this. DAG is extremely simple. Um, you have that DAG object, right? We're setting the schedule, we're setting uh, some documentation. And then for a schedule, I'm saying, hey, look at this upstream data set to trigger this DAG. But really, um, all we really had to do to like actually get the DBT 
project to parse an airflow is we had to call this import right here from Cosmos. So if you've pip installed Cosmos into your environment, this will be available, right? And it's just called a dbt task group. I'm, I'm instantiating that class right here. And I'm saying, hey, uh, go to go to this this folder. The, the, the folder that I want is in dbt. It, it by default uses this dbt as a root directory. And it looks for this project inside here and says, hey, look for the Jaffel shop directory. And it knows, oh, there's probably a dbt project inside of that Jaffel shop directory. So we've we've made it super easy. And we've said, and, and we've if you instantiate this class, it will parse out that entire dbt project with all of its dependencies and run in test nodes to run it in Airflow the same way that it would be run if you ran a dbt CLI command. Now, there's a couple of extra arguments that we've added as we said, hey, my target, I want to use that Airflow DB connection that exists in the Airflow UI, right? We saw that under the admin connections menu. We'll go back there just real quick as a refresher. There's that Airflow DB connection that's, that has all the parameters to connect to my, my Postgres database, um, host, schema, login, password, whatnot. Luckily for us, this is really easy because we're running it in Docker. So all the parameters are just Postgres and 5432 for the port. And that instantiates a connection to, to our, um, to our uh, Postgres database running in Docker. And so we're saying, hey, use that Airflow DB connection as kind of your target uh, to run those models in that SQL against. And just some extra args I'm adding in here. I'm saying, hey, there's a schema within that database called public. Just use that. Just put all of the, the, the materialized SQL inside of that schema. Additionally, I'm running DBT inside of a virtual environment. So here's the path to that virtual environment. Uh, so that that's this is actually not necessarily required, um, but it's nice to it's kind of a nice to have for customers who have dealt with those dependency clashes. A lot of them will and eventually set this up. And then, as you can see, I have a couple of empty operators on both ends of this. So like I have empty operator does nothing. It's more of just like a visual aspect. It's kind of like a placeholder, if you will. So Airflow like executes it as a task, but it's like a, it's kind of like a dummy task just to like, it's like a reference point almost within Airflow. So as you can see on my pre DBT workflow, I set that as the first thing that runs. And then I'm running my entire Jaffel, Jaffel shop project. And then I'm running a post DBT workflow. So now that we've kind of given you the lay of the land of the Jaffel shop DAG, let's go back and look at it and what it looks like inside of the Airflow UI. So going back to DAGs, here is Jaffel shop. Uh, and we can click on that. And here's the grid view of those tasks. Let's go to the graph view, which is displaying the same information, just in a different kind of view. And voila, we have that pre-DBT workflow, which was that first empty operator. We have the post-DBT workflow, which was that second empty operator. And then we have the Jaffel shop project. So that class that we called that DBT task group class that we imported from Cosmos is going in and it's parsing out all of those dependencies um, and creating basically, um, oops, do I have to expand them all? Oh, I have to expand them all again. Um, it's creating dependencies. So it creates task groups for each uh, dbt model and it's doing a run command, uh, dbt run command to actually run the SQL and compile the SQL against our Postgres database. And then it's running a test command. So if we have a suite of tests, check again, checking for dupes or, or data quality issues, nulls or unique values that you're expecting uh, against that stage customer's table, it will check for those. So um, it's dynamically sets all those dependencies for you based on how you've written your GPT code and it, and it executes it accordingly. And it ran successfully. So the cool thing is, is we can actually go to, I probably should have used PyCharm because then I can run SQL. See if I can get that open here. We can go to that Postgres database and we can even take a look if we want. Um, so let's go file, open, desktop, Cosmos, examples. Okay, so I'll just open this project within PyCharm. I have a little bit of, I have a little databases tab here that I like to use. And if we add a Postgres SQL data source and just use those same connection parameters that were in our Airflow connection, uh, we'll say localhost for 5432, Postgres, Postgres, databases, Postgres, let's test that connection, see if it works. Cool, it worked. 
So now we're connected to that Postgres database that's running within Docker. And then inside of that Postgres, remember I said, hey, in that DAG, I defined the schema. I said, hey, use the public schema within Postgres. So now we'll see if we go here. Oh, maybe not. Let's see here. Oh, it's just taking a minute to, to parse out the actual schema and the tables inside of it. But um, let's see, maybe we can refresh it. There it goes. Cool. So <laughs> funny thing, all of these tables are actually not DBT. These are actually tables that Airflow is using as well. Like I said, this is the Airflow metadata but you'll actually see the DBT tables like sprinkled in here. So if you look at like, um, there's, customer conversions that's not a da that's not like a an airflow table but dag obviously is so this is also housing the airflow data but again in like a production environment you probably wouldn't be doing this you'd be using like a dedicated postgres database or stuff like instance or redshift instance or whatever to actually materialize this stuff uh this is just good for kind of like a pov but here's like raw customers which is the table i just i just selected from um i think let's go to a, a transformed one Let's see, do we have just customers? We should just have customers. Does not exist. Maybe it is named something different. Hey, look at that. So here's like an example of the um, the transform SQL uh, that those DBT models was basically churning through, maybe aggregating or uh, doing whatever to uh, to build kind of like that polished SQL table at the very end that either gets loaded into a database, into a, you know, gets bulk upserted into maybe an API endpoint or reported on in like Tableau or, or your, you know, visualization tool of choice or whatever that may be. Uh, so hopefully that gives you kind of like a, a good amount of context as to what's going on in that DBT model, as well as how it's being parsed out in Airflow and how easy it is to basically spin up a sandbox and mess around with the stuff and get hands on with it. Um, so yeah, I think that pretty much concludes like the demo portion of Cosmos, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. There have been no questions in chat so far. You guys answered them all. We got a really knowledgeable group here. I feel, I feel, like they probably just, they're like, yeah, we already knew this. Chris, come on. <laughs> I've definitely seen examples of airflow before and stuff. I just haven't seen it compared with the DBT like this. So it makes it a lot simpler and easier. When we first started to implement airflow at one of the places I was at three or four years ago now, it was a lot more confusing and hard. And there was a lot of just basic setup about airflow. You know, it was not it was not by any means polished, let's call it that. And it was, it was at a much earlier stage. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, um, I worked for a, a FinTech company here in, at the intersection of Bangor and I-15 called NAV. I don't know if any of you guys have, have heard of it, but they, they were using Airflow as well. And that was my first exposure to it, you know, a few years back and they were running like 1.x versions of Airflow. And when I had the opportunity to come to Astronomer, I saw just like how much it had grown. Um, it felt like there was like definitely like a period of stagnation uh, during like the 1.x, like the late 1.x versions of Airflow where like nobody was like, like the, it felt like the, the open source community wasn't going anywhere. Like it felt like it was just kind of like, kind of like grinding to a halt almost. And then Astronomer, um, I'm really grateful that Astronomer kind of like steward, took stewardship over the project and was just like helped it along because there's been so many cool features that have been released in like the last like even like I even think about like the last year of features that have come out and like how much I utilize those in data pipelines and like advice to that I give to astronomers customers so there's a there's a lot uh that goes into it and uh and a lot that you can learn now for those of you who this might be your first exposure to airflow I would highly encourage you to go to that uh, link. It was the second link uh, that I shared, the last link that you see in the Zoom chat uh, to download the Astro CLI. 
Again, that's a free tool and you can bring up Airflow locally on your computer if you have Docker desktop installed, which is also free. Uh, and you can mess around with Airflow, code a DAG, uh, you know, get your, get your, get your hands dirty. Uh, I know that in our docs, we actually have like a whole learn section uh, if you're new to Airflow. So if you want to like try this out, there's a bunch of tutorials with DAG code um, in here as well. Uh, so they have like getting started, uh, like step-by-step -step on like how to trigger a DAG, how to write a DAG all that good stuff. So if, if, uh, if you're interested in this, take a look, I'll go ahead and drop this link in, in the chat as well. I'm on mute. Does anybody else have any other questions? I guess not. I will go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.